to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. Last month, when I was back in Kansas visiting the in-laws, I came across an article in the news that told about a middle school student who wanted to promote a prayer event at her school. The prayer event was um, See You at the Poll. You're probably familiar with it. Students gather around the, the flag to pray. It's an annual event. But she was barred from putting up the flyer because the flyer had a Bible verse on it that quoted Jesus talking about God's love for the world. What was interesting about the article is that it also gave some examples of some other flyers that were allowed at the school. One of them was promoting Lil Wayne, and they quoted Lil Wayne on the flyer talking about uh, good weed and alcohol. That one was okay. Lil Wayne, fine. Jesus was not okay. Those stories really aren't hard to come by these days. We see the marginalizing of Christianity. It's becoming more common it increases every year. We tend to notice it at Christmas time. So in the news, we read about a medical center in Georgia that banned students from singing any religious-themed Christmas carols. Even though these students had come every year, this year it was different. And, and Silent Night, Joy to the World, O Come All Ye Faithful, were not allowed. Another school district I read about this year removed um, all the religious references from Silent Night. I don't know what's left. Like, I don't know if they just hummed it. I'm not sure what happened with that, but they took all the religious references out. Maybe you read in the news about a public university, Eastern Michigan University, removing a Christian student from its graduate program for school counseling because of her Christian belief that homosexual behavior is morally wrong. And the student's attorney explained that the university told her she would be allowed to remain in the program if she went through a remediation program so that she could see the error in her ways and rethink her belief belief system. We're going to give her that opportunity. In a similar case that was filed against the Augusta State University in Georgia, uh, counseling student Jennifer Keaton was allegedly told that if she wanted to graduate, she needed to stop sharing her Christian beliefs with other students. A North Carolina pastor was relieved of his duties as honorary chaplain of the State House of Representatives because he closed a prayer inciting the name of Jesus. So these stories have become increasingly common, and it starts to feel a little bit like, you know, no, we're not so much a nation under God and becoming more and more a nation that's over God. And one of our church members last week stopped me and told me about tweeting um, on his personal account. He tweeted a, a, um, a conviction, a biblical conviction, statement about a biblical conviction. He was called into the boss's office the next day, told that he had to take it down. Um, last week, in, uh, four, it was four in the morning, and I was driving my 15-year-old daughter, my middle daughter, to the airport. She was leaving to go on a mission trip to Nicaragua. And as we drove, she started telling me it was still dark out and streets were quiet. She was telling me about an experience that she had on social media. She had responded to someone else's critical comments about Christians, and her response was very loving, and but she defended her faith and and almost immediately, somebody else started calling her names that I won't mention here in church. And I tried to encourage her a little bit and give her some scriptures. And I said, you know, actually, it's a good thing that happened because you're, you're blessed when things like that happen to you. The Bible says that when we are um, insulted and falsely accused because of our faith in Jesus, that God notices that and he blesses it. And, but we, we just kind of talked as we drove about some of the challenges of living out our faith in our current culture where it's going to increasingly feel like you're the minority, and how's that, how's that look? How do you live that out? And I was just kind of imagining what kind of conversation she might have with her 15-year-old one day. 
I wanted to spend some more time kind of giving her some counsel and some encouragement on the subject, but we were getting close to the airport and I was getting ready to put her on a plane to go to a different country. Um, she's been out of the country a number of times, but always with me. So this was kind of new. She's going, you know, with the group, but without her dad. And so I thought I want to give her some unsolicited advice, which is really the only kind of advice you give 15 year olds uh, is unsolicited <laughs> I'm not sure that there's ever solicited advice, but I wanted to just talk to her a little bit about what to expect and, and um, just reminding her some things about going to a foreign culture. Uh, she'd not been to Central America before, and so I told her a little bit of um, what she could expect. Here's what the people are like. Here's what the food is like. And we, we talked about that because I didn't want her to be caught off guard by some of those differences. And, and I reminded her that, look, you might feel homesick at some point on the trip. I'm not sure that she did, but I, I was saying to her, you know, it's okay. If you feel homesick, that's normal. It's normal to feel a little bit homesick. Don't be thrown off by that. When you feel a little bit homesick, just let that homesickness remind you that it's just temporary. It's just a trip. You're going to be coming home soon. So, so when you're there, you know it's temporary, then be joyful while you're there. You know, let your light shine bright. You're not there very long, so let your light shine bright. Make the most of your time. I told her a hundred times, you know, don't lose your passport. Keep your passport, that's your identity. It tells you who you are and it's other people that you're a citizen of the United States. So hang on to that. And I reminded her, it's important that you stick with the, gr the group. You know, when you're in a foreign country, it, it's really not a good idea for you to be off by yourself. You don't know the language, you don't know the culture. So it's best if you stick together. So we started just kind of talking about these things where I'm giving her some counsel about, you know, how to, uh, to live when she goes to Nicaragua on this trip. And I'm, I drop her off and then I'm, I'm coming into the office, still dark, and I start thinking about our conversations. Where first we talked about some of the challenges of living out her faith here and what that looks like in the future and how to respond to people. And then the second conversation in my mind was totally separate, where I was talking to her about what she needed to keep in mind as she headed to Nicaragua. And it just struck me as I drove away from the airport, these things go together. The conversation is very similar. The counsel that I might give her as she heads to Nicaragua really kind of falls in line with the counsel that I might give her as she lives out her faith in an increasingly hostile culture. And so um, that metaphor, that imagery is consistent in Scripture, this idea that we are foreigners in a strange land. Peter uses it, that we are strangers, that we are aliens. He helps us identify ourselves that way so that we'll know how to live. And so in these next four weeks, we're going to be in a series called The Outsiders. And you know, my daughter really encouraged me as, as we talked about these things to preach about them. She said, Dad, I think it would be really helpful if you talk to people about how to talk about the things that are hard to talk about. And so that's what this series is going to be. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Peter. We've been in James, so this is real easy. It's, it's the next book over. So he, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. And I want to tell you that, that I was not planning on this series. I hadn't prepared for this series. We usually plan series months in advance. Um, and I did something I don't remember ever doing before where I changed an entire series a few days before it was to begin, the, the week of. But, but as I just hear more and more of these stories, and as I talk to, to more and more folks in the church, it just seems that what Peter is going to write to us about is especially relevant. And, and, and quite frankly, if I could just be honest, you know, I cringe my way through Christians' responses to these things on social media. Like, please don't. Oh, you did. And I read through these different responses, and, and we need to know how to, to address these things and the spirit that God would want us to have. And so Peter's writing to Christians who are experiencing persecution. Uh, it's really just beginning for them. It's going to get a lot worse. Nero has taken power, and things are going to get bad. And so he's writing to them about living out their faith in this, this culture. And so for those of us who aren't always sure how to respond when someone disagrees with what we believe or, or maybe even mocks you or attacks you, then his words are going to be helpful to us. The audience that he wrote to, these Christians, were facing a very uncertain future. Um, many of them had already been arrested. They were being ostracized. They were facing a loss of jobs, loss of property, because they identified as a follower of Jesus. Some of them were being tortured and beheaded. We see that, of course, in our world today as well. 
And so I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, I think what might be helpful to us, though, to kind of set the stage is just to talk briefly about persecution in the context of church history. Um, Charles Pope uh, from Washington, D.C., has, has done some good work in identifying different stages of persecution, not just in the book of Acts and first century, but, but throughout church history. And so he gives these five stages of religious persecution and, and adds a little cultural context to it. Um, and I, it's just helpful, I think, to establish some spectrum of persecution. So I'll just go through these quickly. Stage one is stereotyping. This happens when a description of a few gets used to describe an entire group, and then it gets repeated again and again and again and again. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you. And so Christians get stereotyped. The description of a few starts to be used to describe an entire group. And so you'll hear things, you know, Christians described as whatever it is, uh, hypocrites, boring, repressed, angry, um, sad, things such as that. Uh, stage two is vilifying. Uh, when Christians don't line up with what's culturally accepted, especially when they speak out against those things, then they're going to be vilified, meaning that uh, they'll have words used to describe them that, that uh, indicate that they're taking other people's human dignity away from them. And so they'll, you know, vilifying words would be like closed-minded, intolerant, bigoted, hateful, homophobic, words such as these. Um, and you can kind of see the progression, right, from stereotyping to vilifying. Um, and vilifying is used as, as a way to help people feel better about not liking a particular group. It, it's a way to help people kind of justify their own intolerance. Um, stage three is marginalizing. And this is what we'll see more and more of. After establishing Christians as, you know, with these different stereotypes and, and uh, vilifying comments, and the move then is to move the church and Christianity into the margins of society, historically speaking. Um, and so they may say things like, you can have your church, you can do what you want to within the walls of the church, but you're not welcome in the public square. And so Christians... Uh, become excluded from positions of, and places of power and influence, be that with business, academia, um, the media. I even read quotes this week from celebrities and politicians stating that Christians uh, shouldn't be allowed to run for public office because they put God ahead of uh, everything else. And so it, it just becomes more and more unacceptable to talk about faith in, in a public way. And so you don't mention God. An athlete m might be interviewed, but before the interview, they'll say to the Christian athlete, look, we, we know you're a Christian, but that's not what this interview is about, so please don't talk about your faith. Don't reference your faith. It's not uncommon. And so it becomes more and more unacceptable to mention God, and it becomes intolerable to mention the name of Jesus, unless you're taking it in vain. And so you'll see more of this, and we've had huge, huge shifts culturally when it comes to uh, the marginalization of Christianity. Stage four is criminalizing, and in this stage, there's this increasing amount of um, uh, legislation or lawsuits uh, directed against the church and individual Christians. You know, so practicing your faith can turn into uh, a lawsuit. Stage five is, is persecution, persecuting. Um, the degrees of which can vary widely. So it could be heavy fines, loss of job, loss of property, incarceration. And of course, as we know in some places of the world, it can become quite violent. So the question is, how do, how do Christians respond you know, to a culture where they increasingly feel, um, feel that way, where they increasingly feel like the minority? Well, you know, there's a tendency, I think, to feel discouraged to feel defeated, demoralized. What we're going to talk about in the series is that really it's an incredible opportunity that the gospel flourishes in these moments. You know, there's a sense, it's our Western culture mind, that we have the greatest opportunity to revival if we are the majority. It's not true historically. Historically, the Christianity does not flourish nearly as well when it carries with it the mantle of power. The kingdom of God tends to advance more forcefully when it's not also carrying with it this, this mantle of power because it makes it very hard for us to communicate some of these core elements of the kingdom of God, of loving, of serving, of grace, forgiveness, of sacrifice, of generosity when you're wearing the mantle of power. So we're going to see that some of us who've been praying for revival, we look at some of what's happening and think, oh, I was praying for revival, we're taking steps back. But historically speaking, we are being positioned to have an opportunity 
to advance the gospel even more powerfully. And so Peter wants these Christians to understand this is an opportunity that God is about ready to give you. And so he begins his letter by addressing the readers this way. He says, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout. And he uses a couple of words here that are identity words, meaning this is who you are. It's how he reminds them at the beginning of this letter. You are elect, you are exiles. And we've talked about this often in here, but behavior has to flow from identity. If you try to tell somebody how to live or how to behave and it doesn't flow from who they are, it's going to not work. Read the Old Testament. It doesn't work. When you start trying to control people's behavior by, by, just, by passing laws and say this is what you have to do, you can't do this, it, it makes people more rebellious. If it doesn't flow from identity, if it doesn't flow from um, the relationship, here's who we are, who's how we understand ourselves with God, if it doesn't come from that, it doesn't, doesn't work. So Peter's going to start, you see this throughout the New Testament, he's going to start with identity language, and then he's going to tell them how to live. But it, it has to flow from identity. So he says, you're God's elect. Maybe your, your version says you're God's chosen people. There's a, there's a tendency when we have any kind of hardship, any kind of suffering in this life, um, to begin to question that. You know, does God even notice? Is God aware? Has God abandoned me? And we become discouraged. And it concerns me, honestly, that many Christians have been in churches where they have been taught that following Jesus means that they'll be exempt from difficulties. And so when that happens, it can really throw them off. Maybe that was the unwritten agreement you thought you were entering into. You know, you come to church, you follow the rules, and God will you know, hold up his end of the deal and make your life easier. <laughs> That's not what we see in Scripture, right? In fact, what you find in 1 Peter is that being a Christian doesn't exempt them from problems. It actually compounds their problems. And, and so he'll say, we'll look at this later, but he'll say, Peter says, don't be surprised. Why are you surprised that these things are happening to you as if it's something strange? So he reminds them that, you know, what they're going through. But, but look, don't forget, you're God's chosen people. He's not abandoning you. You are his. And then he uses this word to describe them as exiles, um, also translated as foreigners or travelers, best translated, most literally translated as someone passing through. Someone passing through, meaning that you're in a land and it's not your home. And what's... What we'll see here is that that's, in, in, for some of these Christians, that's literal, but Peter in his letter is going to use that um, metaphorically as well. That they are not, um, they're not at home. You know, that they're aliens, they're strangers, they're exiled. This world is not their home. Heaven is their home. And if you're discouraged and if you're defeated with things that are happening around you in this world, then if you can learn to look at this world through the lens that Peter gives us here, through this lens that it's not your home, you're just passing through, it makes a lot of difference. And so in verse three and four, he reminds them of their true home. Here's what he says. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he's given us this new birth into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, and that is kept for you in heaven. So Peter speaks about a living hope. He says that it can't perish means it can't be touched by death. It won't spoil. It's not contaminated by sin. It doesn't fade, so it doesn't erode with time. And so he, he's going to challenge these Christians, and we'll see this in the next few weeks. He's going to challenge them pretty strongly about how they live, but what's he doing here? He's setting it up. He's saying, look, it has to flow from your understanding of who you are. You are God's sons and daughters, and you have an inheritance that is kept for you in heaven. If you're just going to try and tell people how to live, you're going to try and tell Christians how to live, and they don't understand this, then it's not going to work. They're going to get discouraged. They're going to get defeated. But if we can get a hold of this, if we can understand our true home, if we can understand this inheritance, then, then we're able to have strength. And we're able to persevere. Um, and so... You know, just remember that. When things get tough around here, it's okay to feel homesick. That's all right. That's pretty normal, feel homesick. You just have these different reminders that this, this world isn't your home and makes you homesick. You know what? It should be that way. It's okay for it to feel that way. Because our home is in heaven. And, and Peter says, in heaven there is an inheritance that is reserved. Uh, reserved is an important word. Um, it, I... Um, 
flew into Atlanta not long ago, and, and I headed over to the, the rental car area. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't very crowded. You never know. But there was this guy. I don't want to mention the name of the rental car company because I don't want to. Let, let's just call it, uh, let's call it Hertz. And so I, I walk over to um, the Hertz counter, and there's, there's this, this guy in front of me who's talking to the young lady behind the counter. This customer, and he is, he's really frustrated and he is upset because he sounds like he may be the most important person on the planet. I don't know who he was, but it, he seemed to have that understanding. And so he's trying to explain to her why he has to have a car. And he's coming up with all kinds of reasons saying, I have to have a car. And she's saying, well, you have to have a reservation. We don't have enough cars. And he says, I have to have a car. She says, you have to have a reservation. And they just kind of go back and forth. And, and for a few minutes, I kind of enjoyed it. It's a little bit entertaining. I didn't even feel like I was paying for it. I just get to enjoy some drama for free. And, and so I'm just kind of listening in. But then he starts saying something about how he's going to use his considerable in, influence to cost the company business. And, and, and at that point, I kind of made a, a point to laugh sarcastically. Uh, in hopes that maybe I get to be a part of it, you know, and, uh, and, and that he turned some of that frustration on me, and he did, I and mean, he wasn't ho overly hostile. He's like, what, what, what's so funny? He's like, you've got a, you, you have a problem? I'm like, I don't, I don't have a problem, but I do have a reservation. Like, I've got, <laughs> got one of those, and so and I kind of laughed and tried to get him to laugh a little bit, and, and we talked for a few moments. Eventually, he heads off to get a taxi, and, and I step up to the counter, and I'm not I'm not frustrated. I don't, I don't feel pressure. I'm, I feel pretty much at peace. I'm not panicked about anything. Why? Because I got a reservation with a confirmation number. I've, I've got what I need and she's got the car for me. And, and that's kind of the idea that Peter's communicating here because we have it reserved. We don't need to freak out. <laughs> we, we don't need to, to feel this incredible sense of frustration or panic. Our, our reservation is good. It says it's kept for us in heaven. The word kept is an important word. It's this idea of completely secure, that it cannot be changed, it cannot be canceled, it cannot be lost. And if you can understand that, and if you can really believe that, then it'll help you respond in a different way, with a different spirit. Jesus says to his followers, don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. I have gone to prepare a place for you. Don't get so upset. Don't get so worked up. I've gone to prepare, but this world's not your home. You're just, you're just passing through. So starting in verse 6, Peter explains that this living hope should translate for Christians into joy. Verse 6, he says, so be truly glad. And one of the things we'll see in the book of Peter is he's going to talk about suffering and joy being something you can experience simultaneously. He doesn't say, look, endure suffering and you will experience joy. Instead, he says, suffer and be glad. Puts those things together. He says, because of, there's this wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure trials for a little while. Says, he reminds us, it's temporary, it's just, it's just for a little while. And these trials will show your faith is genuine, as being tested as fires tests um, and test and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. And so what happens to gold when you put it in the fire? It gets purified, it gets brighter. That gold is actually an opportunity, uh, or fire, rather, is actually an opportunity for gold. And, and so that's, that is the opportunity that we'll, we'll talk about in the series, that actually fire gives Christians an opportunity to shine more brightly. Suddenly we start to look, hopefully, much more distinct in how we love and the joy we have and the peace we're able to experience. So, Peter says, when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you... It'll bring you much praise and glory and honor. It says you. It doesn't say it'll bring God much praise and glory and honor. I guess that's what feels right there, but he says it'll bring you much praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So he reminds them of this day that is coming when Jesus will return. And he reminds these Christians, your hope is not of this world. Your hope is in heaven. Your hope is not in government. Your hope is not in being popular or well-liked. Our hope is in heaven, so be truly glad. NIV says that we greatly rejoice. And so he, Peter says, when you experience trials, you might be a little bit homesick. That's okay, you're not home yet. But you can be glad and you can rejoice because your time here is short and you need to make the most of it. Um, this winter, my family spent about seven weeks in Haiti and we had diff some difficult moments, but nothing major. You would have heard about it by now, just little things. 
You know, little things like you know, my, my four kids being in a room that was 100 square feet, including this little bathroom with no door on it. You know, the, just little things that kind of make you miss home. Um, things like, um, you know, just missing a hot shower with water pressure or being sick and not having the right kind of medication or um, not having electricity for, you know, the majority of a day or just the frustrations of trying to communicate with people where you don't speak their langui- language. Nothing major, just little things. But the longer we were there, I noticed something that uh, we weren't doing intentionally. It just kind of happened. And the longer we were there, the more we just kind of talked about home. And so we'd sit around the dinner table, and we weren't really excited about what we might be eating that night in Haiti, but you know what the conversation would be about? Five guys. Five guys, burgers and fries. And we would all kind of go around, and we would tell what we were ordering, and we, we weren't planning that. Nobody said, what are you going to eat when you get home? Let's talk about that. Let's all go around the table. No, we just talked about it. It was kind of natural that the longer we felt not at home, the more we tended to just talk about home, and, and it was fun. And it, it helped us laugh, and it helped us endure and one of my favorite moments was the second night we were there. I had fallen asleep, and I woke up to my wife um, yell. And uh, she shook me awake, and she said, what is that? What is that? And it was, it was a whisper. It's kind of a scream, because she whisper screamed it. So, well, what is that? And I opened my eyes to see uh, an R-O-U-S in our room. Who knows what that is? Extra credit if you do. R-O-U-S? Rodent of unusual size from Princess Bride. <laughs> I thought we were Christians in here. Hello. <laughs> Y'all have some homework to do. So, uh, rodent of unusual size. This is a rat the size of a German shepherd is in our room. <laughs> now, remember, this is 10 feet. This whole room's 10 feet. That's how far it is. So, uh, it's, just go, it's just right there on the windowsill. And it was dark. And it's kind of scurrying back and forth. I'm trying to convince her it's a squirrel. That Haiti's got some big squirrel problem she doesn't know about. And, <laughs> and um, eventually it runs up and finds a hole in the roof and disappears and we go back to sleep. I go back to sleep. And, um, a few hours later, she, she wakes me back up. She whispers, screams again at me. She says, what? wake up, wake up. And she wakes me up. She points to the trash can. She had hung this uh, trash bag on the closet door and the thing was just shaking just violently. And the rat had gotten into the trash bag but couldn't get out. And so for her, this is an answer to prayer as long as I remove the trash bag, right? So... Um, so I get out of bed and I'm kind of, I put a chair next to it cause I want to reach up high and grab it, you know? And, and so I'm on the chair and I'm reaching for this, this trash bag. And she's like, right before I reach for it, she says, wait, wait, wait. And I turn her, let go. I turn around like, what's wrong? And she gets her phone out. She has the video camera on. So like, okay, okay, great. It's going to be hilarious, isn't it? And so she records this, you know, this one breathless act of bravery as I grab that trash bag and I open the door and I, I throw it out into the hallway. And, and then we just laid in bed and we laughed and we watched the video half a dozen times, just laughed our way through it. You know, you know why we were laughing? Because we don't live there, right? <laughs> like if that whole thing had taken place in our home, in our bedroom, nobody would have been laughing. That, that would not have been funny. It's funny for us because we don't, we don't live there. We're just there for a bit. Then we're going home. And, and so when you, remind, when you remember that, when you're reminded of that, you, you can have a good sense of humor. You don't have to get all worked up. Our home is, is temporary here. A beautiful example of this is Acts 13. And Paul and Barnabas have been preaching. When we read that the people there started talking abusively about them. Verse 45 says they heaped abuse on them. And Paul and Barnabas don't uh, get right back in their face. Don't start pointing fingers and making accusations. Instead, I I love this, verse 51, after all of this abuse they took, it says, so they shook the dust off their feet and they went to the next town and started preaching the gospel there. Uh, The message paraphrases it this way in Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas shrugged their shoulders and went out to the next town, Iconium, brimming with joy and the Holy Spirit, two happy disciples. Really? Really? Because they had just been vilified. They had just been persecuted. I mean, shouldn't they be standing up for themselves? Shouldn't they be giving it right back? Isn't that how they should respond? Wouldn't that be the just thing to do? Eh. Eh, Shake the dust off their feet. And they make their way. Two happy disciples filled with joy, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the question is, how are you going to respond Now it begins with this right heart where we're homesick, but we're happy. (laughs) We're homesick for heaven, 
and doesn't um, dismiss the challenges and the struggles and the trials of this life, but those things remind us this world is in our home. And then we're happy because we're only here for a short while. And while we're here, we are to let our light shine. We have a joy that can't be robbed. We have a hope that can't be touched. And I think we must look awfully shallow, awfully shallow to those in this world who hear us worship God and talk about heaven and then lose our minds when things don't go our way as if God is not on his throne. And some of you, um, you know, you need to be okay with the fact that people may not always like you. The Bible says that that's actually a good thing. The Bible says to beware when all men speak well of you. A red flag should go up if you're living your life in such a comfortable, non-threatening, status quo way that everybody thinks you're pretty awesome. And as a church, you know, we'll have people try to stereotype and vilify and marginalize us. We've had that. We'll have that. And I know for some of you that's going to concern you, being a part of a church where that happens. But you know what should concern you? Being a part of a church where it doesn't. That's what should concern you. We need to kind of let go of this idea that our happiness is dependent on other people's approval. I'll, you know, I'll just tell you that if you believe the Bible and if you follow Jesus, some people won't like you. And you know what? That's okay. We're not junior hires. Not everybody has to like us. It's all right. We can still like them. We can still love them. In fact, we have an even greater opportunity to do such. So let me ask you, where is your hope? Where is your hope? Because that really is at the core of what we're talking about here. Let's not be Christians who ho whose hope seems to rise and fall with every election or every law. Let's not be Christians who seem to have more hope in the Supreme Court than in a supreme being that we claim to worship. Let's not be Christians who put our hope in politicians legislating morality as if that would work anyway. Let's put our hope in Jesus changing hearts. Let's not consume ourselves with 24 hour a day news stations. Let's not be dissecting the latest polls with a sense of despair. Let's remember whose we are. Let's stop thinking about so much about what other people think. Let's, let's think about what God thinks. Can we not put our hope in cultural approval and cultural acceptance? Is it really that big of a deal? Let's put our hope in the eternal reward that is kept for us. Let's not confuse what kingdom we are living for and what kingdom we have put our hope in. So look, I'll just tell you what I told my girl as I drove her to the airport and dropped her off for her trip to Nicaragua. You might feel a little homesick. Some of you feel a lot homesick. That's okay. It's supposed to be that way. You're not home. But you'll be home soon. This trip is short. It's going to be over before you know it, really. It won't last much longer. So while you're here, why not be joyful? Why not let your light shine? And can I encourage you to stick together? Because as foreigners, you don't want to go it alone. We need each other. And by all means, don't lose your passport. You are an official citizen of heaven. You have an inheritance there that will not perish, spoil, or fade. You've got a reservation that's already been made. Let's pray. So God, um, would you help us with, with this? Um, would you help us just get a glimpse of the hope that we have in you? I, I think that so much could be... Um, aligned in our hearts and in our spirits if we just understood the hope that we have in heaven. But, but we need your help getting a glimpse of that. So would you allow us to see it? And would you allow us to look at some things through that lens, some of the suffering, the hardship that we'll experience, both personally, culturally? Would you help us to see it through that lens? God, would you just remind us in those moments where we feel a little discouraged? You know, we don't have to pretend like everything's okay. It's not okay. It's okay to feel homesick. But you just remind us, God, that we're, we're passing through here, that this isn't our home. But Lord, would you help us that while we're here, that we would be people who are known for our joy, for our love, for our grace, for our commitments and our convictions. 
people who live as citizens of heaven. So teach us that in these next few weeks, God, as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to talk to someone about... <clears throat> if you want to talk to someone about putting your hope in Jesus, that's what we've been hitting here. If you want to talk to somebody about that, this would be a great time to do it. I, I know, because I've done it, you know, all of us put our hope in different things at different times. This doesn't work. And so if you're at that place where you kind of realize it, if you're not there, you'll get there and you can come back then. But, but if you're already there and you realize you're putting your hope in things that just don't stand up to the pressures of life, then, you know, learn a little bit more about putting your hope in Christ, what that means. And I would also encourage some of you who are not a part of a church family to become a part of a church, whether it's this church or whether it's another Bible-believing church in our community, become a part of a church because increasingly it's not going to be a good idea for you to try to do this on your own. You know, we are going to need each other. We're going to need to stand together and so we'd love to have you as part of this church family. But like I said, if it's not this church, then you find a Bible-believing, Christ-centered church and you step over the line and, and commit yourself to other people so that you can, you can stand together. But if you want to talk to someone about being a part of this church, again, you can meet me down front. Let's stand and let's worship our great God.